Today we're going to be reviewing uh, some unused features or features maybe you didn't know that you had available to you in SOLIDWORKS or SOLIDWORKS suite of products. Uh, so my name is Braxton Kersing. I'm the application expert up here in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, I have a history in designing portable automotive lifting equipment. I have my elite certification and I specialize in data management solutions, so SOLIDWORKS PDM and SOLIDWORKS Manage. Um, I'm the guy on the left. Uh, the guy in the middle is David Foster. He's our AE down in Houston. And on the right, we have Travis Jones, our AE in, in the Dallas office. Uh, it's a little fishing trip we did for one of the tuning series up in Waltham. Uh, so just a little bit about MLC CAD systems, if you're unaware. Uh, so we're one of the top five uh, largest VARs in the U.S. Uh, we primarily are in the southern uh, region, but we, we kind of spread up into the Midwest and up into Pacific Northwest. Um, so we've been at this for about 38 years now, uh, and our team is highly uh, certified. We, we are one of the most certified VARs in, in the U.S. as well. Just a little breakdown uh, to look at the territory that we're in. So this is everywhere you see one of those little circles is, a, is an office that we hold and then we service uh, all the states that you see here uh, some with mastercam some cell work some a mixture of both and so i'm going to go ahead and jump right into it uh, the first feature or application uh, that many people are unaware about is solvers visualize so solvers visualize is a uh, its own standalone application if you have SOLIDWORKS Professional or Premium and an active subscription, you get this product for free, uh, at least the standard version. And so most of what we're going to be seeing in this portion of the webinar is going to be focused on those standard functionalities. But I am going to show off some of the some of the capabilities that you will unlock if you purchase the professional license of Visualize. So we're, we're going to be taking a look at a speaker throughout this presentation. This is actually something that we designed in-house. We actually 3D printed the housing and, and uh, got the boards and have a working speaker uh, at the end of the day. Uh, but with Visualize, this is opening just a native SOLIDWORKS file. So I can browse to any part or assembly file and open it up uh, without having to do any pre-data uh, conversion uh, to be able to open it up in this application. And the really nice thing about this is it will retain the structure of the of the file uh, from SOLIDWORKS, uh, either based on the parts, the features, or the appearances that are already applied in SOLIDWORKS that get brought in automatically. And so we get to see the breakdown of the model, the breakdown of the appearances. If we want to change any properties about the appearance, we can come in here and do that as well. Just like SOLIDWORKS, there is an entire library of appearances that we could choose from. And some of these have bump maps, so they're going to have that three-dimensional three uh, appearance. Uh, in, in this case, we have both local and cloud um, appearances. So it, it's a pretty vast number of appearances that we have available to us. Um, what, we did 3D print this housing at one point, so uh, it was actually see-through. And the nice thing about applying appearances in Visualize is, is that it's quite literally a, a drag and drop to the surface that I want it to apply it to. Now, the rendering that we're seeing here is happening in real time. I, I do have the, the resolution a little bit smaller so I can uh, quickly see the updates. But as I rotate or add uh, lighting or additional environmental um, surroundings, I can see the update in, in real time. So if I apply something like this diamond plate, uh, what we'll actually see is it, it's kind of see-through. It sees the surfaces on the interior side of the shell of the housing, and it creates a pretty complex looking appearance for us here. So everything we're seeing here, this is just pretty standard out of the box, uh, visualized standard. Uh, down at the bottom, you, you will see a, a timeline. So in, in 
Visualize Professional, you do unlock a uh, animation capabilities. So if you have motion studies in SolidWorks, you can bring those in. Um, but you can also do just a regular, uh, like a turntable uh, rendering. And so it's going to render every frame out, but it's going to give you that kind of showcase look to your uh, model. I've got a preview mode. It'll be a little faster. It's obviously not as um, high resolution, but we can see the interior and everything. And this is just automatic capabilities. Now in 2018, they actually added a pretty cool feature uh, for physical uh, dynamics. And so what I'm going to go through here is I'm actually just going to open up a SOLIDWORKS document here. And this is, like I said, just a native SOLIDWORKS assembly or part file. And actually, I have, I can actually view my recent documents here uh, from SOLIDWORKS. It looks like I don't have it in my recent, so I'll go ahead and open that for us. And so if you were at our 2018 launch event, you might've seen this before, uh, but really all I have are just a bunch of coffee mugs um, and I kind of move them about. Um, so if I, if I want to move them some more, I can just click and drag these, these handles. And from the, the model menu here, we have these, uh, the ability to turn on the physics um, representation. So if I want this one to stay stationary maybe, and then the rest of these, I'm going to just have kind of drop uh, from, from their current position, then I'll just turn on this dynamic simulation. And so the cool thing is I, I pretty much just, we'll click play uh, to have the physical dynamics uh, run on this. So I got to turn on the view here. And so it's really nice. It, it kind of gives you a, a, um, a natural formation of, of your files and you can even shake them around and see how they'll settle. So uh, just to kind of show off the, um, some of the end results, you know, these are renderings that were done in Visualize. If we have a speaker, we might want some headphones to listen to our music. And there's a coffee mug. So this is kind of stemming from that physical dynamics. And I do have a video of the vehicle that I can show off as well, but it gives you that nice kind of natural look and feel of the, of the files. I'm going to go ahead and step into SOLIDWORKS now, and we're going to take a look at the actual modeling of the speaker and maybe some techniques that are less commonly used than others. And when we take a look in SOLIDWORKS, we have the full assembly. And I'm just going to open up the housing and focus on how we make the front and back uh, housing pieces for the speaker. So I'm going to kind of, I'm just going to roll back real quick and we're going to investigate the lip and groove first. It's definitely not the most commonly used feature, but it can cr help us create some complex uh, mating uh, surfaces between a multi-body part. I'm just going to move this off a little bit so I can see what I'm doing. It's kind of like an exploded view in a part and go ahead and added my lip and groove feature. And for the lip and groove, it's going to basically uh, need from us, you know, where's the groove being applied and then where's the lip being applied. So for the groove, which will be the back panel here, I'm going to basically select the face that it's going to apply to and then also an edge where the groove should be created.
So I, I only need to pick up one edge here on that, from that face, and you can kind of see that preview come in. So it's going to create a groove for the lip to mate into. So just following the same process here, I'm selecting the surface, and I'm going to select an edge. And so we get to see the preview on the lip side of things as well. And now in the parameters section, we can control, you know, how, how thick or how long that lip is and how deep is the corresponding groove, as well as any tolerance values that we need to help it uh, slide into itself without any interference. Takes a little second to get it because it it does have some complex surfaces in here, and we get to see the end result. And if I go ahead and just minimize or sorry suppress my move body command, we'll get to see them together. And then I'll take a section view so we can actually see how the tolerancing is handled and you know how they're mating together. So you see here, I, I've specified uh, about, I think, 20 thousandths for my tolerance uh, for the mating faces, and they butt up right next to each other, but I could provide some gap as well in here. Now, one of the artifacts of using this slip and groove on, on kind of a, a non-tangential surface or edge is that we do get some artifacts here. And also we have less control over how the groove is actually created. So um, just gonna hide one of the, one of the bodies here, uh, you know, if I wanted it more to contour around the outside edge, I don't necessarily have that control with the lip and groove, but there are different means that we can create that geometry. We're going to take a look at an alternate method here, and this is going to be rely heavily upon the intersect command. So if you haven't used the intersect command, it's kind of like the split command, but it takes a step further and it will actually create uh, bodies from the negative space or uh, interference between two parts. And so with this first intersect feature, all we're doing is intersecting or creating a kind of midsection here where the lip and groove will actually be uh, maintained. And this intersect is quite literally just using a surface body that cuts through the middle here. And it, what it's doing is using that along with the other bodies to just create a third section. So step into the feature, just kind of take a look at the selection options. Uh, so we see we have the surface body itself and then the back body of the housing because these were already split. And it's just going to basically do what the split command is doing. It's creating another body so that we can manipulate it to create a, a more customized lip and groove formation. So what we've done is from this section, we've created an extended surface and this extended surface is using the outer edges with an offset in the sketch. So we can kind of see that with this preview, it's just a quarter, quarter inch offset from the outer edge. And then we extrude the actual surface out so that we can, and what this is going to represent is the outer edge of the groove on that back housing. So with this second intersect here, what we're actually doing, we're taking that surface body and we're splitting that top portion and the bottom portion so that we'll have ultimately the one body is going to be our groove and the other body is going to be our lip. So we're, we're, we are using a heavy combination of surfacing as well here. And with the surface offset, this is actually representing the tolerancing between the groove and the lip. So we have about 20 thousandths again uh, between the 
extended surface and the offset surface so that we can cut away the lip portion to create that tolerance. So that's where the surface cut comes in. It really just removes that small section. So I'm gonna hide a couple more bodies so it becomes a little clearer exactly what, what step was taken here. So if I go normal, you see there there is a gap here. And so that was created with those two surfaces. And so now all that's really left to do is to add the interior body to the front housing piece and then the uh, outer body to the back housing piece. And so that's done just with the combined feature. So that's uh, the Boolean operation to add two bodies together. And so ultimately what we're left with is a more customized lip here on the front face. So we have this portion here, this this kind of matches the lip and groove feature, uh, but we weren't able to necessarily make the outer contour match the outer face of our speaker housing. So I'm gonna hide that and take a look at the back body as well so we can clearly see how those two made up. And just take a quick section view so we can see that tolerancing that we use for with the surface offset. So as we can see, a little bit more control. Uh, intersect is definitely one of those features that has a lot of power. Uh, it can create those negative bodies that we often see on, on support cases uh, of people trying to find out how, how to create those. So uh, using that in combination with surfaces, you can really uh, create your own very highly customized uh, part models. And lastly, uh, I'm gonna kind of build upon what we saw in Visualize. We saw we could bring in uh, appearances, appearances that have textures. And on the notion of textures in, um, I believe is 2019, the years kind of run together for me, but there, uh, they added the capability of having a three-dimensional texture that you could apply to a body. And so I'm going to go ahead and just find a texture in here. Um, let's see. Yeah, we have, we have some uh, default 3D textures that SOLIDWORKS does apply. And the thing to know with 3D textures is these are really just... Um, black and white images. So the the white would be where the uh, bump actually occur and the black would be um, left behind. So I'm just gonna take a standard like neural pattern here and apply it to um, the back body. And so you can clearly see it's just a black and white image. But once it's applied, what you can actually do is come up to the bodies section. So if this is hidden, you might only have one body. You can always uh, show it to get to this menu. Uh, but when I right click on it, there's a, a 3D texture feature. And when I click the 3D texture, if I have multiple appearances, I can choose which one or if multiple surfaces selected uh, from that body with different appearances. I can select them independently. Uh, but essentially I just need to turn it on and you can't necessarily see it all too well. It's very faint. So we'll use these sliders to control how how large the uh, offset is, how fine the elements are. The finer the elements, the, the cleaner looking the image will be. So as I start to increase the bump map, it, it becomes very obvious, uh, that 3D texture. So when I apply it, what it's actually done here is it's created a graphical body. This body can be printed. So we can save this imported bo or this graphical body out as like an STL file to send to like a 3D printer. And so you can create pretty complex uh, surface shapes just from a, a black and white image, which is pretty cool. Uh, oh, also rendering. So <laughs> renderings can look a lot more professional when you add these pretty complex textures. So just to end the speaker portion of this webinar, this is the actual speaker that we did uh, build in-house. So the housing is 3D printed. We did purchase the speaker uh, portions and 
we've assembled the circuit board in, inside of that uh, in-house. So pretty good sounding speakers. So another feature that's also included with uh, SOLIDWORKS Pro and Premium is the costing analysis tool. And this could be used really by anyone with access to SOLIDWORKS and maybe some information about a supplier uh, and their practices or their pricing uh, for machine time or cutting time. And we could build up our own templates to really represent how, how much they might charge for uh, creating a certain part or maybe what the difference in cost might be if we make certain modeling decisions. So I'm just going to be investigating a, a pretty standard plate here. And you're going to find the costing analysis tool on the evaluate tab in your command ribbon and you go over to costing. So once you click on this, it's going to bring up a new window in your task pane on the right. And from there, we, this is where we'll set up the analysis. So just off the bat, it's going to pick uh, a template that matches my a machined part. So it's going to make some assumptions based on the model. And so this is a machine part. I'm going to send this off to Mike's machine shop. So I'm going to be using this template. It's automatically picking up the material from the actual material applied to the part. And so I'm going to give it some additional information. Uh, the material cost, this is also defined in the template, but we can make manual overrides. And then the first thing we should probably address is what, what kind of body or stock are we machining this from? So uh, we can just do a standard plate with a thickness. This is also controlled by the template, what's available. Or we can also switch this to a block and give it some dimensions, maybe some additional stock that uh, should be there for removal if we need a nice surface finish uh, on the cuts. And so just by making these selections, what it's doing, it's actually breaking down the features into uh, cut paths. So it's saying, you know, there, there's the perimeter of this cut is almost 1300 millimeters. It, based on my template, this is I can cut at a, a certain feed rate and it costs about this much for the machine time. And so that's how it can determine uh, the manufacturing cost, which about 14 percent of the pricing for this and the material cost, which would be based on the volume and the price per kilogram. Now maybe I want to investigate if I were to add some pockets to this to lighten up my part, uh, how does that change the pricing for it? You know, how much more is it going to be for the extra machine time? So what I have here is just a, another configuration that I'll switch over to where we remove a lot more pockets, take a lot more weight out of this plate design and it's automatically updating my costing results. So we're, we're at about 43.40 right now uh, based on my, my template assumptions. And we can see that adding those pockets has is, is increased the cost about 25%. And that's seen in the manufacturing time. We can also see the additional mill operations that were added uh, to this analysis for those pockets. The costing is a great tool. Uh, if you have premium, it can even be applied in, at the assembly level and kind of wrap up what an you know, overall assembly will cost. And it's really going to at the part level that we're seeing here and wrapping it up for you at the assembly level. Quick peek into the template setup. And we can see, uh, based on the material, if it's machine or plastic or printed part, we can add materials into our template. So you would kind of build this up to, to represent the standard materials that you bring in. And then we can also assign certain um, cutting speeds for the different thicknesses of the material. If it's cut, uh, if you have your own mill machine, you know, give it different feed rates um, to, to calculate how much time it's going to take to remove that material and ultimately how much is that going to cost. 
And then you can even build in um, your own rules, kind of like an if then statement um, for you know whole size maybe or uh, finish that you would select. Um, so you can really kind of customize those templates to match whoever your supplier is, or if you have it in house, get a good idea of, of how much time and, and money it's going to cost for your, your design. Moving on into the assembly environment, we're going to be taking a look at this robotic arm. And as you can imagine, there's quite a few joints here, quite a bit of movement that we've designed into this assembly. And maybe we want to show this easily in an animation, or we want to show different positions without having to create a bunch of configurations and um, dig through our mates and find out which ones are the angles or distance mates that are controlling that position. So for that, we use the mate controller. And I'm going to switch over into the robotic arm assembly. And we can see there is a mate control already set up, but I'm going to go ahead and jump into one from scratch. So you're going to find the mate controller under the insert mate controller option. And so the first thing we need to do is tell it which mates we're controlling with the mate controller. Now, it actually has some intelligence here. It's able to identify what mates could be controlled by the mate controller. So clicking that smart mate option, it's gonna go ahead and find any distance or angle mates that I have set up in my part. So we can see I've, I've named these to make it a little bit easier to work with. I have the base twist. So just dragging these sliders, you can see how the arm might move. So what I'm going to be doing is just setting up my starting position. And so with the starting position, I'm just going to uh, run the update, and then I'm going to add a new position. So in this dialog, we can give it a name. So maybe I'll say this is the extend function. And so the extend function, maybe I want the arm to reach out for an object to pick up. So I'll find my angle. So this upper arm angle, I'll go ahead and extend this out a little bit. And along with the elbow angle. And I'll go ahead and update the position for my extend. Go ahead and create a new position. So we'll say pick up object. And I'll go ahead and reach down a little bit, get the elbow, and update my position. And we'll create one more. I'll say this is my clamp position. And so the clamp is actually going to close these grippers. Looks like they were already closed, so we'll just leave that there. And so we can actually go through these positions to see exactly how they are. So maybe if I want to change the grippers to actually be open um, during the extension, I can just go back through these positions, change the value, and update the position. I'll go ahead and do that for remaining items here. And I'm going to call that good. So at this point, we have the mate controller. And if I ever click on this, I can actually change the position without ever changing configurations. Uh, there is an option to create configurations if that's what you desire. But you'll see here, it, I didn't create any configurations to achieve this functionality. I'm not having to suppress mates or change the values of those mates because the mate controller is doing that for me. Now, if we want to make an animation from this, we just go into our motion study tab. I'll leave it on animation. And the really nice thing about the mate controller is this is a functionality included in the animation wizard. So 
pull this timeline up a little bit so we can see it a little bit better. And the animation wizard, it, you're going to see here the second icon uh, after the timeline. And when we turn this on, we can actually, the, the rotate model, if you haven't used this before, you can just create an automatic rotation of your, of your file. Uh, but we do have the mate controller option because there is a mate controller feature. So just select that radio button. I do have multiple mate controllers because I started with a finished version. Uh, so I can select which one I want. Uh, maybe I have two different ones for two different functions. And then I can control how it imports it. Do I just want it to create key frames uh, for the individual parts at the uh, positions I set up? Or do I want to actually create uh, rotary or linear motors to control those movements? Uh, since this is a basic animation, I just leave it at key points. I'm not trying to do a motion analysis or anything to understand uh, forces involved. Give it a start time. I don't have any animations. I'll leave this at zero and click finish. And so now we can go ahead and calculate or click play to run the animation. And what it's going to do, it's going to go through the positions that I've set up. We see it go down to the object clamp. If you haven't worked with uh, animations before, what you can also do is copy the keyframes. And then paste them. <laughs> and then once, once you do that, you can actually invert them to create maybe the opposite hand movement that we we used for the with the make controller. So I'll just highlight these uh, new keys that I copied and pasted, and I can reverse the path to close it. So there'll be a little gap when it closes, and then it'll go back to the starting position. And I didn't have to set up any keyframes manually. Uh, this is all done using that make controller. So if you have movement or design motion in your assemblies, uh, make controller is a great way to show that off and then ultimately use it in an animation. And take a step further, if you have Visualize Professional, you can bring in this animation and create a photorealistic rendering uh, without very much effort at all. Now, for those of you working with large assemblies, um, performance is always probably front of mind for you. You know, the, the more components you have, the more computer resources that it's going to take, uh, maybe the longer open times you're dealing with. And, and so a lot of times what we see on support is how do we make this better? How do we work with assemblies uh, without so much wait time? And so utilizing this, the same robotic arm, a big proponent to help you with this uh, analysis is going to be the assembly visualization tool. And so you're also going to find this on the evaluate tab in your command ribbon. And we'll go ahead and just say, click on the assembly visualization. And so by default, it's going to show me the mass of the, of the parts and it's going to provide me with uh, kind of a color coding to show me um, if I sort it by mass, you know, which, which parts are the heaviest? So we can see the base stand is colored blue. That's going to be the heaviest component. Uh, but we're not really concerned with the mass uh, if we're investigating why we might have some slow performance in our assembly. Uh, and, and what we can do, we can click this little arrow off to the right of mass. And at the very bottom of this menu, there's a performance analysis option. And so when I select that on, it changes my column sets here. And what it brings in are the graphics triangles, the open times per the part files, and then the rebuild times for each part. And so these are kind of broken down into different segments where you know the open time obviously is going to affect how long does it take you to open the, open the assembly. Uh, so you can investigate different features or um, ultimately you'll probably end up at the rebuild time. You know, how long does it take to rebuild the file? Uh, so when you open it, it's going to perform that rebuild operation. And so the rebuild, anytime you switch windows, also gets triggered with assemblies. Um, you can disable that, but that's the default behavior. And so that can definitely add some, some more wait time when you're working with these larger assemblies. So if you can reduce the rebuild time of a part, 
you're going to uh, improve the performance when you're working with this assembly. A big, a big uh, item there would be if you have text in your part files, if you have modeled threads with helixes and cuts, you know, those are going to add to the rebuild times. Or if you have very large patterns, that can also increase the rebuild times. Uh, another note on patterns, the geometry, um, geometry pattern option will reduce the rebuild times if you have a large number of instances in those patterns. So open times rebuild definitely helps with the speed you can open the file and the speed at which the file will rebuild when you're working in it. Now the graphics triangles portion of this, this really gives you an indication on, on how well the performance might be for the zooming operations, panning, rotating, interacting with the model, uh, you know, how smooth is it? So sometimes you can start to see some of the smaller parts or more complex parts go into these blocky shapes. And that's because you're, you're reaching a, a threshold of, of your graphics capabilities and, and the complexity of the model. So if you can reduce the graphics triangles, you're also going to see some better performance in those painting, rotating, and zooming operations. 2020 did bring, uh, or I should say 2019 introduced the beta and 2020, the fully featured enhanced graphics capabilities. And you'll find that in your system options under performance and enhanced graphics. And what that really ultimately does is utilizes more of the functionality or capability of the graphics card. And also gives you kind of a scaling uh, approach to performance with higher end cards. So that really should help eliminate some of the blockiness, but it's always good practice if you're having poor performance to try and get these numbers down a little bit. Now on the topic of large assemblies, we also have to deal with their drawings. So in 2020, we did introduce a new open uh, mode for drawings. So one of the models that we used for the 2020 rollout was a, was a very complex machining center. Uh, and, and so we have a multi-sheet drawing of that full assembly of the machining center. And so one of the new modes is called a detailing mode. With the detailing mode, it's going to open up much faster. Uh, our, our controls are somewhat limited, but we are still able to add dimensions, notes, move drawing views around, uh, add annotations like balloons to parts that will still link to that bill materials. So this is, a, a like I said, a very complex drawing, a very large assembly with multiple pages and views on each page. So the detailing mode um, will still be faster. It's still going to take a little bit to get it open, but we'll see the, the speed at which we can interact with the drawing. So as we can see, we have multiple sheets. When I switch through these, you see it's pretty quick. Um, you know, it's, like I said, this is a full assembly. It, it's got a lot of detail in it. If I want to add any dimensions, I am able to use the Smart Dimension tool to add those in. And when I save this, if someone opens it fully resolved, obviously those are still going to be there. So uh, a nice, nice way to work with these larger drawing files if your assembly is slow, your drawing is probably also going to be slow, but provides you another outlet to improve your performance. So we can see adding a balloon still picks up the item number, can snap to my magnetic lines. So all that functionality is still there. It's just a little limited in, in actually being able to create a drawing view. But at any point, you can click the Resolve Drawing and resolve all the components so you can make those section views or detail views that might be missing.
And last up inside of SOLIDWORKS, we're going to take a look at the structure system functionality. So if you haven't seen this before, this was introduced in 2019 and they've continued to improve upon it in 2020. The really nice thing about the structure system is we don't necessarily need 3D sketches to create very complex structures. So you're going to find a new tab in your command ribbon for structure system. Um, if you don't see it, just right click on your tabs, go to tabs and make sure that it's checked on. And so when we begin a structure system, we need to begin with a primary member. So with my primary member, we have a few different options to create these. And based on what's available to me, I have some planes, some sketch points, sketch line. Uh, so at any point I can connect the points together. Get over to the point and select a point and Maybe I might want my end condition to just be point to point. So when I select these, what it actually do is create a chain to those. I just need to select my profile. So using those points, we can connect them. Uh, we can even kind of bring them together at a single point. But for this, what I'm going to create is a structure that uses these points. And to specify the direction and distance, I'm going to use the up to plane option. So I want to go up to this top plane. Let me get this other point so we can get both. We can even control the direction even with an up to plane option using a sketch line. So once I create my primary members, then it's time to shift into the secondary member. I want to provide some supports for these items. And so what I'll do is select the primary members that the secondary should be joining to. And the first option I'm going to be using is a support plane member uh, using planes. And so once I have these selected, I can choose a plane where the intersection should occur. And we see it adds some new sections at those points. Now we see the top one's a little offset. I'm also want to change the size. So shifting over to the profile tab, I can change to a different profile size. See those uh, change. And then I can also change where the pierce point is on those planes. So to make sure that we're getting the top member to terminate the top of the primary members, I just select the point like you uh, might be used to in weldments to change the pierce point. So we can see that's terminating quite nicely there. Now I want to add one more support that goes through the middle here at an angle and splits itself into multiple pieces where it meets these uh, secondary members I just created. And so what I'm actually going to do is between two members now, and I'm going to select the top and the bottom option. You can see it just automatically connects them together. And for my, I'm just going to use a length ratio where this is zero and zero. So I get the ends of it. I'll flip this so it's at an angle. Now I do want it to split where it meets these uh, middle sections. So I'll check on the split member option and let it know that these are the two members that should be splitting it. And finally, I want to rotate it so that it's the same orientation. And so I'll use the profile alignment and just shift it 90 degrees. Now it hasn't split yet and it hasn't managed the corners yet. And that will happen automatically when we leave the structure system environment. So you can see it automatically steps into corner groups of simple where two items are coming together. Um, you can set the trim options for all together or select individual and control them independently. So for like this section here, it's trying to do a miter. Uh, I might just want to do a planar cut and I can control the trim order. And then we have the complex corners where we have multiple members come together. And it's actually pretty good about uh, judging what the trim order should be, what the trim entity should be. 
I don't really need to make any changes there. Just accept, and we'll take a look at the finished body. So we see we have these members are split. If I hide this member, we can see how it handled the complex uh, corner. And then to finish the structure, I can use uh, just a standard circular pattern using this central axis. Now in 2020, what they added when I go to the body section is we can actually just select an entire structure system. I don't need to select all the bodies that I created from my initial structure. I'll bump this up to 12. So our large structure is definitely starting to take shape here. Um, one thing I need to do though is, is connect them. So what I can uh, start is just another structure system and use uh, the secondary member option to connect these together. And so what I'll be using is just member pairs. So I'm gonna select these two members and the middle two. And select my planes, just like I did in the initial setup here. Once again, they're kind of offset, so I'll change the pierce point to be the top of my profile. I'll click OK. Uh, once again, the corner treatments will happen once I leave the structure system. And we can, again, just control these as, as, we, as needed um, individually or all uh, as one. And so same thing, uh, once, we, once we have those support members, we'll just throw in another circular pattern and we'll do the bodies again with the structure system. And when I select one of the members, it gets the entire structure system itself. Hit the green check. And now we have a 200 plus member uh, structure using the structure systems that really required one sketch with a couple points and a couple planes. So very complex structures can be created without a lot of input uh, from the user. Now the last thing I'm gonna cover is, and it's kind of been working behind the scenes this whole time, is SARS PDM. So SARS PDM, if you didn't know, is uh, included with your pro professional and premium licenses of SOLIDWORKS. So PDM standard is already included if, you're, if you have those packages. Um, and so what I wanna just peer into is what does this look like? How do we interact with it? So I'm just gonna go back into SOLIDWORKS and I'm gonna save this uh, structure system into my vault so we can kind of see what the process would look like. So, as you saw, it's just a standard folder, saving, opening, there's really not going to be much of a difference there. The main difference is going to be how we interact with the properties and how do we uh, work with older versions and old a history of a file. So I'll come back to this data card here in a second. But yeah, this, the save operation is exactly the same. Now, flipping over to the actual folder here, uh, you're going to see it's based on your file explorer. There's really no difference in uh, interface. But when I um, select files, what you're going to see is this bottom half kind of populates with information. So this is the data card that we were, we saw when I saved my structure system. Uh, these are tied to the properties of the file, and they can all be searched upon. So for my structure system, we see it show up here, but it is checked out. So check out is really just a way to say this person has ownership of the file and they're currently working on it. So 
I was currently working on the structure system. I am done. So one of the operations that you use in PDM is a check-in. So there is an add-in for SOLIDWORKS, so we could do this directly from the SOLIDWORKS application. And when I do a check-in, what it, that's doing is it's creating a historical version for me. So at any point in time, I, if I make a change, I can go back and see maybe what's changed, what properties might have been updated. So if we take a quick peek, we can see that three-dimensional model in my file explorer. So this is using just eDrawings Viewer. Uh, so people, even without SOLIDWORKS, will be able to see this if you give them permission to see it. So if I, at one point, wanted to make changes to this file, this is where I would want to check it out and take that ownership. So it's a right click. You see the check in, check out. And so what I'll go ahead and do is just check this out and I'll make some update to the data card and like the description. And so these are mapped to the custom properties. If you're making drawings of this model, you would get that description to come in as well. Uh, but I've updated my description on done, so I'm going to check it in. I'm not necessarily going to make a change to the geometry. And I can provide a comment. So people, you know, year down the line will know what I did because when we do that check in, check out, it's creating additional versions that can always be looked at in the history. So right clicking on any file, we can look at this history and see what's changed, who changed it, uh, and when did they do it? And so we'll always have this, this historical uh, look back into the file. And we can even, if you have the permission to get older versions, so we can see maybe what has changed. Now, another big part of PDM is the workflow. So when you create your design, is there an approval process? Is there some release process to make sure the revisioning is happening at the right times and it's being announced manufacturing or uh, production? And so if I were finished designing this, I might right click and say, I need to change the state and submit it for approval. And so this could be set up to send out uh, uh, through PDM standard a database notification, or if you go up to PDM professional, it can be set up to email. Uh, but we can send this through and what it's going to do, we see the state updates to waiting for approval. Now, it, it, as an end user, that's pretty much what you would see. And I'm just going to show you what it looks like on the back end uh, for the administration side of things, what the flow would look like for this vault. So with PDM standard, you get one workflow. If you bump it up to PDM professional, you can have multiple here, but this is a typical flow of a file. Uh, only certain transitions would be allowed for certain users. So like the no approval required probably wouldn't let everyone do that. But uh, if you're a manager or if you're an admin, you would have access to that when needed. And so this, this is designed to be updated. It can grow with you and your organization. PDM is, is definitely scalable. Uh, if things change and you need to kind of make a shift in, in how you how you manage your procedures. And the last thing uh, I want to show, and this is new in 2020, is this quick search option. This will search into any variable that I set up. Right now it's set up to look at the file names. Uh, so if I type in like speaker, for instance, it does a search just right in this view. And so I, it's finding quite a few files that have speaker in the name. And you can even right click and browse to that location. So like I said, this can be set up to look into the description or maybe even a material value uh, that you need to find a part. And what we find is that that definitely helps eliminate uh, duplicate work or duplicate models in your structure, which is always hard to work through.
Last but not least, uh, there is a bill materials uh, uh, tab. Uh, so this will actually give you the structure of an assembly. It's calculated from what's actually included and it be saved out into Excel. Uh, so if people outside your organization don't have access to this, you can quickly and easily share this information. Uh, contains shows a lot of the same information, but you can build in your own custom relationships between files. So like a Word document to an assembly file, not necessarily a, a default reference that's created, but you can do that manually. But the biggest one that I like to show and I, I I think it's the most uh, valuable is this where used. Where used, if you have a part, you can see what all assemblies that part's used in. So if you think about a change process and you need to change the bolt pattern on a part, you need to make sure it works in all the assemblies it's used in, or those assemblies also need to be updated to use a different part because the one you're changing is going to render it unusable. So where used is, is very powerful, it gives you all that information. And the nice thing is you can open, check out, and and work with the assembly directly from this tab without having to go navigate to that file. PDM brings a lot of capabilities that help you manage your uh, CAD data or it, really any file types that you would work with throughout your process. And also make sure that people are adhering to your procedures and that the revisions are happening at a, an appropriate time in the workflow. So that concludes my uh, presentation on some of the unused or maybe un lesser known uh, features or functionality that you might already have with your SolidWorks licenses.